What makes the surgical management of a posterior polar cataract challenging each and every time is the possibility of the opening up of the posterior capsule at any time during the surgery and the potential complications that can occur along with it. And hence, in this video, I'd like to share with you what I would consider the important principles and the technical considerations in the management of a posterior capsular rupture that occurs during the surgical management of a posterior polar cataract. At the outset, I'd like you to be mindful of the fact that a posterior capsular rupture can occur at any time during the surgery, typically as a result of some intraocular manipulation during the surgical procedure itself. So it is very important that whenever we take up a patient with a posterior polar cataract that we have at hand each and every time an anterior vitrectomy set up. Let's now learn together through the example of this case wherein there was a posterior capsular rupture noticed during the removal of the epinucleus. The surgery has been uneventful up to the nucleus emulsification. But when I get to the point, I noticed the typical spindle-like tear in the posterior capsule at the 7 o'clock position. What is of utmost importance is when you notice a tear in the posterior capsule during any stage of the surgery, you do not suddenly withdraw the instruments because a sudden removal of the source of irrigation, that is the phaco probe, would result in the vitreous herniation into the anterior chamber. So, as soon as I noticed it, I took even more care and caution to very carefully remove the entire epinucleus without withdrawing the probe at any time. Upon the completion of the epinucleus removal, I withdraw the second instrument and perform a viscofluid exchange. In this manner, I'm able to maintain my anterior chamber at all times and this aids me in preventing any vitreous prolapse. What's interesting to note is that you cannot generalize this. Now see what happens in this case. As soon as the phaco probe is withdrawn, after the viscofluid exchange, you will notice a vitreous prolapse. Now the disturbance of vitreous is the indication for the limited anterior vitrectomy. We now proceed to performing the tricot assisted anterior vitrectomy. At the outset, the incisions are enlarged to allow for the ease of entry of a 20 gauge vitrectomy cutter. Do note the typical spindle shaped defects in the posterior capsule that are seen in patients with posterior polar cataracts. We now proceed to performing the tricot assisted anterior vitrectomy. As you can see here, this is the vitreous being stained with the intracranial injection of triamcinolone acetonide. I believe that staining the vitreous with tricot is an extremely essential step because it clearly delineates the prolapsed vitreous. Let us now move to understanding the principles of anterior vitrectomy. This is a 20 gauge vitrectomy cutter. And these are the following settings that can be used. Now on the Laureate machine we have two options. One which is the cut IA as you can see here. And this mode is used for actually cutting the vitreous. We work with a cut rate of anywhere between 600 and 1000 cuts per minute with a vacuum of 150 to 200 millimeters of mercury. Different machines may have slightly differing settings. However, the principles and the setup is largely the same. Once the anterior vitrectomy procedure is completed, the surgeon now needs to remove the cortex. In order to do so, one of the options is to go into the IA cut mode. In this mode, the vacuum at the vitrectomy tip serves to aspirate the cortex whilst the irrigation is usually maintained by an infusion from another sideboard. I will now demonstrate the technique of anterior vitrectomy. At the outset, it is always important to cut the vitreous that is prolapsed out of the eye. For this step, I do not require any added infusion into the eye. I introduce the infusion into the eye prior to the introduction of the cutter. 
and then proceed with performing the anterior vitrectomy. Please note at this point how well delineated the vitreous is as a result of the triamcinolone injection. I proceed with the anterior vitrectomy first just within the wound, then within the anterior chamber. I then move to the pupillary plane and finally slightly deeper, that is at the level of the posterior capsular rupture. I ensure that I'm always aware of the direction of the port. I prefer for it to face me. However, sometimes I may need to turn it to one side or the other should I need to cut the vitreous coming from that direction. Once the vitrectomy procedure is completed, I remove first the vitrector, perform a viscofluid exchange and then the source of the irrigation is removed. What signifies a successful anterior vitrectomy is an anterior chamber that is completely free of any vitreous strands. I then move to removing the very minimum amount of cortex with a bimanual irrigation aspiration. The reason why I choose to use a bimanual irrigation aspiration is because I am very sure about the completion of my vitrectomy. If I wasn't, I would then possibly use the vitrectomy cutter itself wherein I would go in the IA cut mode to remove the cortex. As you can see, there is almost no cortical material there to be removed. Upon the completion of irrigation aspiration, once more I perform a viscofluid exchange and then we prepare for the implantation of a three-piece IOL in the sulcus, for which the incision is now enlarged to a 3.2 mm incision followed by the introduction of some more viscoelastic and then we move to the IOL implantation. What I have found really works is the introduction of the nozzle significantly into the anterior chamber. Then with care and utmost caution, the leading haptic is introduced into the ciliary sulcus. The eye oil is introduced into the eye and then after ensuring that the leading haptic truly is stable in the ciliary sulcus, the trailing haptic is hitched at the optic haptic junction and is rotated in the ciliary sulcus. The eye oil is now stable in the ciliary sulcus. I now proceed to performing a posterior optic capture that will be visualized in this part of the video. In a posterior optic capture, the haptics remain in the ciliary sulcus and as the name suggests, the optic is nudged posteriorly so as to come to lie posterior to the capsular rexus edge. I now proceed to remove all the excessive viscoelastic from the anterior chamber with minimum disturbance to the optic and ensuring at all times that the optic edge remains behind the capsular rexes. Once I've completed that, I then go ahead to performing a stromal hydration and that will bring us to the end of the surgery. I do hope this has been a useful learning.